and uh, this poem is Acquainted with the Night oh. by Robert Frost. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the farthest city light. I have walked out the longest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. And I have stopped to hear the sound of feet when far away a distant cry came over housetops from a distant street, but not to say good night or say goodbye. And far above, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaims the time is neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. The Fairies by William Allingham. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we dare not go a hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather. Down along the rocky shore, some make their home. They live on crispy pancakes of yellow tide foam. Some in the reeds of the black mountain lake with frogs for their watchdogs all night awake. High on the hillside their old king sits. He's grown so old and gray he's nigh lost his wits. With a bridge of white mist Columkill he crosses on his stately journeys from slave league to Rosses, or going up with music on cold, starry nights to sup with the queen of the gay northern lights. They stole little Bridget these seven years long. When she came down again, her friends were all gone. They took her lightly back between the night and morrow, they thought that she was fast asleep, but she was dead with sorrow. They have kept her ever since, deep within the lakes, on a bed of flag leaves, watching till she wakes. Up the rocky hillside, through the mountains bare, they have planted thorn trees for pleasure here and there. Is any man so daring as dig one up in spite? He shall find the thorny's set in his bed at night. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we dare not go a-hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather. Uh, the Princess by uh, Tennyson. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white, nor waves the cypress in the palace walk, nor winks the gold fin in the portrait font. The firefly wakens, wakened thou with me. Now droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost, and like a ghost she glimmers unto me. Now lies the earth all dying to the stars, and all thy heart lies open unto me. Now slides the silent meteor on, and leaves a shining furrow as my thoughts in me. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest thou, 
and slip into my bosom and be lost in me. Yeah. Woo! The word uh, Poseidonus in this uh, next uh, poem is the name that the inhabitants of uh, Atlantis, described by Plato, called uh, their country. Atlantis was the largest of a series of islands supposedly beyond the pillars of Hercules, all of which sank uh, the island of Atlantis last of all. And their god, their chief god, was Poseidon, the lord of earthquakes and the ocean, which turned out to be unfortunate for them. But this is by Clark Ashton Smith about a minor god, Ugabalis. In billow lost Poseidonis, I was the god, Ugabalis. My three horns were of similar above my double diadem. My one eye was a moon wan gem found in a monstrous meteor. Incredible far peoples came, called by the thunders of my fame, and fleetly passed my terraced throne, where titan pards and lions stood, as pours an everlasting flood before the wind of winter blown. Before me, many a chorister made offering of alien myrrh, and copper-bearded sailors brought from isles of ever-foaming seas enormous lumps of ambergris and corals intricately wrought. Below my glooming architraves, one brown eternal file of slaves came in from mines of Chalcedon. And camels from the long plateaus laid down their sard and peridots, their incense and their cinnamon. But now, within my sunken walls, the slow, blind ocean serpent crawls, and sea worms are my ministers, and wandering fishes pass me now, or press before mine eyeless brow as once the thronging worshippers. Thank you. I love it. American poem by James Whitcomb Riley, uh, once a very well-known and popular uh, poet. Um, Little Orphan Annie. Little Orphan Annie's come to our house to stay. To wash the cups and saucers up and brush the crumbs away and chew the chickens off the porch and make the fire and sweep and dust the hearth and bake the bread and earn her board and keep. But all us other children, when the supper things is done, we sits around the kitchen fire and has the mostest fun a listening to the witch tales that Annie tells about and the goblins that gets you if you don't watch out. And once there was a little boy who wouldn't say his prayers and when he went to bed at night away upstairs his mammy heard him holler and his daddy heard him bawl, and when they turned the covers down, he wasn't there at all. And they searched him in the rafter room, the cubby hall and press, they searched him up the chimney flue, and everywhere, I guess. But all they ever found was just his pants and roundabout, and the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. And once there was a little girl, who used to laugh and grin, make fun of everybody and all her blood and kin. And once when there was company and old folks was there, she mocked them and she shocked them. And she said she didn't care. And then, just as she kicked her heels and turned to run and hide, there was two great big black things 
was standing at her side, and they snatched her through the ceiling, for she knew what she's about. And the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. And little orphan Danny says that when the blaze is blue and the lamp light flickers and the wind goes woo, you better mind your parents and your teachers and fond and dear and cherish them what loves you and dry the orphan's tear and help the poor and needy ones that clusters all about. Or the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. <laughs>
and the Torrible Zone and the hills of the Chankly Bore. And they drank their health, and they gave them a feast of dumplings made of beautiful yeast. And everyone said, if we only live, we too must go to sea in a sieve to the hills of the Chankly Bore. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. Wow. Ah. Try to keep it brief so we can go quietly into this good night. Gently. Gent, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I, I meant him. gently, but Hit him it's now. quite quiet. <clears throat> uh, lines of Shelley from Hellas. Worlds on worlds are turning over from creation to decay, like the bubbles on a river, sparkling, bursting, borne away. But they are still immortal who through birth's orient portal and death's dark chasm, hurrying to and fro, clothe their eternal flight in the brief dust and light, gathered around their chariots as they go. New shapes they still may weave, new laws, new gods receive. Bright or dim are they as the robes they last on death's bare ribs had cast. A power from the unknown god, a Promethean conqueror, came. Like a triumphal path, he trod the thorns of death and shame. A mortal shape for him were like the vapor dim which the Orient planet animates with light. Hell, sin, and slavery came, like bloodhounds, mild and tame, nor prayed until their lord had taken flight. The moon of Mohammed arose, and it shall set, as while blazoned on heaven's immortal noon, the cross leads generations on. Swift as the radiant shapes of sleep from one whose dreams are paradise, fly when the fond wretch wakes to weep, and day peers forth with her blank eyes, so sweet, so faint, so fair, the powers of earth and air fled from the folding star of Bethlehem. Apollo, Pan, and love, and even Olympian Jove grew weak, for killing truth had glared on them. Our hills and seas and streams, dispeopled of their dreams, their waters turned to blood, their dews to tears, wailed for the golden years. The Dirt on Baseball. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> In 1920, during a fast-paced game, a wild pitch got away and killed a batter. One player and coach, Lena Blackburn by name, finding a slippery ball to be the matter to nip this dire scenario in the bud before each game would coat the ball with mud. Upon that sphere to firm the pitcher's grip, they tried shoe polish and tobacco juice to seek what substance might prevent a slip. But neither kept the ball from being loose. So now the secret mud assists his aim, a big league staple in the Hall of Fame. The company reaps six harvests every year from hidden holes in a New Jersey fen, aged for six weeks, the magic mud so dear is packaged in two three-pound vats and then sent to each team 
the same feldspar-rich clay to rub upon the baseballs on game day. The earth, our world, is such a muddy sphere, pitched over the solar system's summer field, arcing around the sun in just a year, a hit or strike still yet to be revealed. Organic mud, the cradle of us all, on evolution's team, declares, play ball. I'll do a short one by Hilaire Belloc, then. Uh, okay. The story of Jim, who ran away from his nurse and was eaten by a lion. <laughs> if I can remember. There was a boy whose name was Jim. His friends were very good to him. They gave him tea and cakes and jam and slices of delicious ham and chocolates with pink inside and little tricycles to ride. They read him stories through and through and even took him to the zoo. But there it was, the dreadful fate befell him, which I now relate. You know, or at least you ought to know, for I have often told you so, that children never are allowed to leave their nurses in a crowd. Now this was Jim's special foible. He ran away when he was able, and on this inauspicious day, he slipped his hand and ran away. He hadn't got a yard when bang with open jaws a lion sprang and hungrily began to eat the boy beginning with his feet <laughs> now just imagine how it feels when first your toes and then your heels and then by gradual degrees your shins and ankles calves and knees are slowly eaten bit by bit no wonder Jim detested it. <laughs> no wonder that he shouted, Hi! The honest keeper heard his cry. Though very fat, he almost ran to help the little gentleman. <laughs> Ponto! He ordered as he came, since Ponto was the lion's name. Ponto! He shouted with a frown. Drop it! Let go, sir! Send it down! <laughs> the lion made a sudden stop and let the dainty morsel drop and slunk, reluctant to his cage, snarling in disappointed rage. But when he bent him over, Jim, the honest keeper's eyes grew dim. The lion having reached his head, the miserable boy was Dead. When nurse informed his parents, they were more concerned than I can say. His mother, as she dried her eyes, said, Well, this comes as no surprise. He would not do as he was told. His father, who was self-controlled, bade all the children round attend to James's miserable end, and always keep a hold of nurse for fear of catching something worse. worse. <laughs> well done! Uh, the first uh, lines I have are from William Blake. Children of a future age, reading on the printed page, know that in this antique time, love, sweet love, was thought a crime. Uh, it's a winter now, and in the dead of winter in January, the fruits from South America that have opposite seasons to us come to the stores. And I'm looking forward to the cherries because I like them better than the ones from this hemisphere. This is the Hymn to Autumn by Keats. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, 
close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days can never cease for summer hath o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amidst thy store? Sometime whoever seeks abroad may see thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind or on a half-reefed furrow, sound asleep, drowsed by the fume of poppies, whilst thy hook spares the next swathe and all its twined flowers. And sometime, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the vast oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Ask not for them. Thou hast thy music too. Where barred clouds still bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the soft wind lives or dies and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born. Hedge crickets sing. Now, with treble soft, the red breast warbles from the garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Excellent. 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 Yeah. 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 Pied Beauty by Gerard Manny Hopkins. Yeah. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of coupled color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coals, chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape blotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is freckled, fickle, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, he fathers forth, whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Thank you. Thank you. I love it.